this weekend and moving up to Monday, April 29th, when we celebrate the 103rd anniversary of the birth of Duke Ellington, a call to Donald Shirley, who knew Duke and Billy Strayhorn, and uh, they exchanged and listened to each other through the years. And it's a privilege to have you there, Donald Shirley. Welcome in. Oh, thank you so much. There's a new composition in your CD entitled D, D, and D, Divertimento for Duke by Don. And you just might, uh, well, give us some uh, insights so that we can follow along as you perform it later on. All right. Well, let's go back as far as George Gershwin. When George Gershwin wrote the Rhapsody in Blue uh, for the piano and orchestra, um, I think every composer in America, and if, if, if not the world, decided they were going to try an, another type of Rhapsody in Blue. So Duke Ellington wrote a work uh, based on Roy Otley's book uh, that was called New Worlds Are Coming, and it was for piano and orchestra. It didn't have any real structural design. It could not be called a concerto. It could not, uh, neither could George Gershwin's Rhapsody, because the Rhapsody doesn't have an architectural designation either. But uh, it was a work for piano and orchestra. So we uh, uh, were scheduled to play it at Carnegie Hall in 1956. This is after our stint about, oh, I don't know, maybe a dozen times we played opposite one another at Basin Street, the original Basin Street. Now, um, on the day of the rehearsal, um, there was, um, we had had a, a, a rehearsal, and one measure was not clear as to who, what had to be done in terms of the orchestra. So I had gone to the movies with none other than Jimmy Dean. You remember, we called him Jamie. You remember East of Eden? Yes. Well, <clears throat> we went to that. I got on the first and last time I've ever been on the back of a scooter. And we got on the back of his scooter. He attended the rehearsal. And uh, we scooted on down Broadway. We saw the movie, sat side by side. And I was transfixed. I didn't realize. It, it, was, it wasn't aware to me that I'm sitting right next to the guy that I'm looking at on the screen. But anyway, after the movie... I decided I'd uh, try to find Billy and Duke. Well, they were at Duke's office at the Brill Building, the famous Brill Building on Broadway. So I left Jimmy, <clears throat> and I went on over there. Now, in the room were Luther Henderson, who really did the arrangement. That's what he called it, the arrangement. That's what's on the music uh, of New Worlds Are Coming. And uh, Billy Strayhorn had certainly made a great contribution to it, and so did I. Well, when we got in there... <laughs> um, the all every part of the orchestra was spread out all over the floor. It was a large room, even larger than my studio room right now. And my studio room is forty-five feet by thirty-five feet. Anyway, all of them were in there with Tom Whaley, who was a copyist, and they were all hunting for this measure. It was almost like the lost chord, only it wasn't <laughs> a chord. It was only. A measure, and there were just a few notes, but there were, I, let me put it this way. <clears throat> there had never been an intelligible score, okay? Had there been a score, it wouldn't have been necessary to spread all the parts out over the floor. Now, I was always regarded by Luther, Billy, and Duke as Peck's bad boy, okay? Primarily because I always had the answers, Okay. When I walked in, they didn't want me to come in. They told me to take my shoes off. I said, for what? And I looked in and saw all this manuscript all over the floor. So I huddled up into a corner, standing up in my socks feet. And, uh, and um, then they, I said, what are you looking for? And they said, well, we're looking for that oboe part. The oboe or the clarinet. I said, where we had the glitch at the rehearsal this morning. I said, oh, I know where it is. <laughs> So there, they said, oh, you do, huh? I said, yeah, well, come on, show, show us, show, show, show us where it is. This is Billy talking. And Luther, of course, was all set also because they both used to beat up on me all the time. So 
So I walked around till I found the parts, because nothing was in order, which is very much like Duke's old career. Nothing was ever in order. Well, I said, okay, I found it. I said, there it is right there. When they found it, you never saw so many magazines and pillows being thrown at me and my head. Uh, and I said, what are you doing that for? Because there again, I was right again. And, they, and that always irked them, and they loved me. It, it wasn't, it wasn't in, 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 uh, they weren't trying to hurt me at all. But that was the beginning of it. Now, that night, <laughs> that night, as we are performing, uh, similar to what one would call a light motif, meaning one instrument introduces a particular theme long before I play that same theme. Well, while Duke was conducting, he turned to me and with his baton and tried to bring me in. And I shook my head to the negative, saying, mm it's not my time yet. And he looked at me and, and, and mouthed the words, oh, I'm sorry, but the audience could not see this. The only people who could see this were, were the orchestral men, members. So I waited patiently until it was my time to come in. When my time came, I came in and we completed the work. <laughs> That's a wild story. It is a wild story, and a very true one. And it was after the performance, the audience was so appreciative, and you know it's just not uh, good etiquette, really, to play an encore after you've played, supposedly, a major work. Well, Harry Carney and Russell Procope kept saying, Donald, come on out, come on back out, come on back out, come on. They loved me, I loved them, and I was pushed back out on the stage, not knowing what in the heck I was going to do. I had not prepared anything to play. So I said, well, I couldn't play anything but Duke Ellington, so the only thing I could think of was I let a song go out of my heart. And while doing it, since uh, counterpoint is uh, is one of my favorite things, and uh, so I then combine counterpartly the uh, uh, the thematic material of uh, "Don't Get Around Much Anymore" with "I Let a Song Go Out of My Heart," and that went off extremely well as well. Now the next time I heard that piece, this is this is typically Duke Ellington, okay. The whole orchestra had been playing that arrangement, okay? <laughs> it was his music, so he could do what he wanted to do with it, but the idea uh, was something that I had introduced to them on that particular concert. That was New Worlds Are Coming. Now, it was long after that that it suddenly dawned on me to do a little uh, tribute to him. And so I did mine in the form of a divertimento, and uh, just called it, D, D, and D, the Veritamento for Duke by Don. But uh, unfortunately, only part of that uh, work that Duke ever heard before he died was the middle section that involves uh, Mood Indigo. And I played it for him. Again, as I tell you, every time I went wherever he was, he would get up and make the same speech. Ladies and gentlemen, we have Dr. Donald Shirley in the house, someone told me. And maybe we can get him to go. He'd start that stuff all over again. So I got up, and this time I had something new to play. I played it. When I got through, uh, all the members of the band, Paul Gonzalez led it, and started fanning the bandstand with their music. Just got up and left the bandstand. Uh, now, of course, it made the audience look as if uh, well, the audience thought, oh, gee, well, uh, I guess they can't do uh, They're not going to try to play anything after that. Well, Duke got on the, on the microphone and said, ladies and gentlemen, we will take a 15-minute break. And the people are still just raging and raging. Now, the truth of the matter is <laughs> Duke and the band, okay, wanted to get out of, of working. That was all that was. And if you think I thought it was such a great tribute to me, I never felt that and don't feel that now. I knew them. Only too well, and if they can get somebody else to do, to, to to take up the time that they would normally do, that's what they would do, and that's what they did. <laughs> so that's how Divertimento came about. Talking with Dr. Donald Shirley about his composition, D D and D, the Divertimento for Duke by Don. Thanks so much for uh, uh, taking time with us on this Saturday night, preceding the date of April 29th in the year 2002 to give us some insight 
and I think you're a very modest man. I'm sure the musicians in the band and Edward Kennedy and Billy were just so impressed. Thanks so much for taking time to talk with us. You're quite welcome, and thank you so much, Lane.